Well, just a brief recap as we introduce uh, our, our subject this evening. Uh, the two sessions ago, we began our series on who is Jesus, and we looked at Jesus, the, the mediator, the appointment of the mediator, so-called when he was appointed, namely in eternity. That is, that covenant of redemption, that agreement between the Father and the Son to save sinners in Christ Jesus. And then last session, we looked at uh, how, how, uh, how Jesus Christ is God. He's a mediator according to both natures, both his divine nature and his human nature. And so when we study Christ, when we study Christology, we really look at the person and the work of Christ. If we could bo boil it down under two subheadings, it's the person and the work. So right now, we're still under that heading of the person of Christ. I think next week, we will start looking at the work of Christ. But as we finish up the person of Christ this evening, we're going to look at his humanity. If you remember last time, I started with, this, uh, with, with the discussion of church history about how throughout history, there are those who either neglect the deity to the, to the detriment, uh, uh, to the, the emphasis of the humanity, are those that emphasize the deity uh, to the neglect of the humanity. That is, so much so that we focus on one or the other. Some uh, uh, take away from his divine nature so he's not truly God. Others take away from his human nature so he's not truly man. But he must be one person, who, uh, uh, very God and very man. One person in two natures, fully God and fully man. And that's what our forefathers confessed many years ago. He's one and the same Christ recognized in two natures without confusion, change, division, or separation. And this is a great and profound mystery, and we'll look more at it tonight under uh, the question of who is Jesus answering and that question with, he is fully man. Namely, but we seek to look and defend his humanity, namely the identity of the mediator in his humanity. We must confess, even though we're Reformed Baptists, all Christians everywhere must confess this. All Christians, regardless of denomination, so to speak, must confess that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. So as we look at Jesus in his humanity this evening, we're going to look at three main headings tonight. We're going to, we're going to look at first how he became man. Secondly, we will look at how he is truly human, that is fully human. Then lastly, we will look at how he is one person. So how he became man, how he is truly man, and lastly, how he is one person. So let's look at how he became man. The scriptures speak of Christ taking on human nature. Philippians chapter 2 discusses this. If you were uh, with us at Free Grace in the evenings, you know that I preached on this several, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a week or so ago. In Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11, Paul says in verse 6, uh, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation by taking the form of a bondservant. He took on human nature. He assumed a non-previously existing human nature. Did you catch that? It did not previously exist until he was born of the virgin, born of a woman, born under the law. You see, there were some in history who believed that Jesus was a person. There was a difference between Jesus and the Son of God, and the, the, uh, the Son of God took over the person of Jesus. That would be kind of awkward and kind of weird if you think about it. Jesus of Nazareth is walking along, and then the divine overtakes him, almost absorbing him, adopting him, if you will. So we must confess that Jesus did not take on a human person, but he took on a human nature, one that did not previously exist. In many other places in Scripture, he's called man. Romans 5.15, the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.21, resurrection comes through a man. 1 Timothy uh, 2.5, one, the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And as I've quoted already, Galatians 4.4, 4, he's born of a woman, born under the law, at the proper and appointed time. And so then, how did he become a human nature? If scripture confesses that he took on human nature, he did that through the virgin birth. He did that what we, through what we call the mode of the incarnation, how he became man. 
And the virgin birth helps us explain why this one, why this Jesus Christ, is the only and true Son of God. So when we think of the virgin birth, I think our minds think of Christmas. We think of that incarnation. And perhaps we think of either Matthew chapter 1 or Luke chapters 1 and 2. But Luke chapter 1 records for us the interchange between Gabriel and Mary concerning Christ who would be born of a virgin. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, Luke 1.35 here alludes to Exodus 40.35. You see, the book of Exodus, the climax of the book of Exodus, is not the Exodus itself, when God took his people up out of the land of Egypt. The climax of the book of Exodus is Exodus chapter 40, when after they build the tabernacle, the, the cloud comes upon the tabernacle, signifying that God dwells with his people. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when we understand the virgin birth, when we understand the mystery and the miracle of the virgin birth, it highlights for us that God dwells with his people. So the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary, and it's based, and it's through this virgin. We also see that, that this is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Many, 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 many years before Christ would come, this great mystery is, is prophesied, foretold. In Matthew chapter 1, the writer applies it to Jesus our Lord, applies it to Mary. In verse, is, uh, chapter 1 uh, of Matthew, verses 21 and 22. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be, be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This great mystery of the virgin birth. Now, we don't, confess, we don't say that Mary is sinless. We do not say that she died. We do not say that she's a perpet perpetual virgin, but nonetheless, God Almighty uses this virgin for, uh, uh, to bring forth the Son of God. And I think there are many reasons why she must be born of a, or he must be born of a woman, born of a virgin. I think there are two that are pertinent and helpful for us when we see the virgin birth. The first is this. Salvation comes by divine initiative. Now, when we think about the Old Testament, there are many barren women in the Old Testament. Is that not true? We think of Sarah in the book of Genesis. She's too old to have children. We think of, uh, we think of Hannah in 1 Samuel. She is unable to bear children. We think of Elizabeth, even in the New Testament, Luke, and she's unable to bear children as well. But what's more remarkable, a barren woman who gives birth or a virgin woman who gives birth? So we see in the virgin birth this profound mystery. We see God's initiative, divine initiative to save sinners in Christ. So that's one reason I think we have the virgin birth. It shows God's initiative. But another uh, uh, thing, significance of the virgin birth is the fact that the Holy Spirit comes upon her. You see, the Holy Spirit is the agent of new creation. And many of the Old Testament prophets prophesied concerning the time when the Spirit would be poured out. So when the Spirit comes upon Mary in Luke, it's, this, it's the initial stages, the initial uh, uh, stages of this last day's coming in Christ. So Christ would be born of a virgin according to the Holy Spirit. He lived the law, die as that perfect sacrifice when he's raised and when he's ascended on high, you see, there's some sense where we need to have an absence of Christ. Because when we have the absence of Christ in his human nature, then he sends the Holy Spirit according to the redemptive plan of history. According to God's redemptive plan to save sinners. So just as Joel prophesies concerning those days, and then 
Luke, Peter applies it to that, but we see in already in the virgin birth that that agent of new creation is already at work in Christ, in Christ's coming, because it centers around Christ our King. So we have the virgin birth, and we even see the significance of Mary's lineage, which is Jesus' lineage, lineage in Matthew chapter 1. He is from, notice the beginning chapter 1, verse 1 of Matthew. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This Jesus Christ is part of the tribe of Judah. This Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. He's the one that they're looking forward to. This, and even further back, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. And when we kind of trace through the Old Testament, when you trace through history, you kind of are asking yourselves, is this the seed? Is this the one? And then it applies even further with the seed of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And as we read through the books of Kings, we're asking that question again. Is this the king? Is this the seed we're looking for? And it traces through it. This king either did good in the sight of the Lord or he did evil in the sight of the Lord. But even the good kings, there's still something wrong with them. Because they point forward to someone else. They point forward to this Christ. They point forward to this Jesus. He is the fulfillment of these things. He, are, he is the seed of Abraham. He is the seed of David. And he is born of a virgin. Now, as I've said already... It shows that God dwells with his people. And it is by his initiative. And because it is his initiative, it shows his great, unchangeable love for people. You see, any other religious system, any other philosophical system, in order to have communion with God, you must ascend to him. But not so with Christianity. God condescends to us in the incarnation. And if you think about sin, what was the, uh, obviously sin is a breach against God's law, but what did we lose when Adam sinned against God? Communion with the true and the living God. And so Christ coming, born of a virgin, highlights for us that God dwells with his people. And we are united to him even now if you are in Christ Jesus. If you've believed on him, you've been united to him. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is at the right hand of God. So the incarnation, the virgin birth, the mode of the incarnation shows us God's love for us and that he dwells with humanity. But he does it in a right and proper way, namely through, through the second person of the Trinity, taking on human nature. So we've seen then how the mode of the incarnation, how he became incarnate. Let us look now at how, at how he is truly man, how he is fully man. And this is, we'll probably flip through a bunch of scripture references here as well. But we see that Christ himself bears the essential properties of what it means to be a human. Christ is what man actually is. And what does it mean to be a human? What are we made up of? Two things. We have a body and we have a soul. And the human body is the basis for the incarnation and the resurrection, which signifies Christ coming as a person, signifies the, 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 the greatness in Christ coming for that. And you see, we need Christ to be fully human. We need Christ to be born of a woman. But some people, as I said at the outset, there were some who denied that Christ was fully human. There were some who taught that Christ could not be, a fully, uh, could not be fully human. They taught that Christ, in order to, to, to skirt the issue, that Christ took some celestial flesh, I don't know, we don't know what that looks like, from heaven through Mary. Now, if you're a Mennonite, I hate to tell you, that was one of the views of Menno Simons. That was one of the views that he held. And it is heretical and it is false. Because if Christ is not truly human, then how can he be like us in every way, yet without sin? So he must have a physical body. You and I have physical bodies. Uh, um, 
So he must be like us. So there are several places that teach that he has a physical body. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2, the writer says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. But notice, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. John 1.14, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifested in the flesh. And 1 John 4, verse 2, it's talking about those who are in a spirit of error. But this you know, the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the... Uh, uh, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. You see, what John is dealing with here are some people who taught that Christ only appeared to come in the flesh. I don't even really know what that looks like. Was Christ some sort of hologram where you went to shake his hand and your hand went right through him? Would he only potentially was like us in some way in a little bit? That's not what the scripture teaches clearly here. John is actually dealing with those very people. He must be fully human. And Jesus himself is even aware of the fact that he is man. Now that's kind of weird to say, but some people deny that very fact. In John chapter 8, verse 39 and 40, Jesus said to them, he's speaking to the Pharisees, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man. Who has told you the truth which I heard from God. And even the very fact that he calls himself the son of man. The son of man is a very fluid term. There's lots of things it could mean. But it very much focuses on the fact that he is human. He is the son of man. He was born of a woman. One writer says when he even referring back to Mary as the mother of Jesus. No one can be a mother unless she has brought forth a man. And no one can be a son of a man unless his existence originates in man. So he must, if he's born of Mary, he must be man. But Christ himself is the son of man. In many ways, he refers him to uh, it's his, is his favorite designation of himself, the son of man. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And even when we think about another, uh, uh, as we think further about what the Son of Man means, it refers to the fact that he is the Messiah. He is the one prophesied of old. And when the Old Testament prophesies of the coming Messiah, they prophesy a man who would come. So he is fully God and fully man, and he has a body that resembles man, that is man. But not only does he have a body, but he has a rational soul as well. When I say soul or spirit, I'm using them inter interchangeably. But we possess a soul. We see this in several places. 1 Corinthians 2.11 Man has knowledge of himself through personal spirit that no one else has. You and I all are man according to our nature. But you and I are all different persons, different people according to our uh, 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 different people. Sorry, that's, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but nonetheless, we, are all, we all possess a soul. We all possess a spirit. Matthew 10, 28. Fear the one who can kill the soul, according to Jesus Christ. And even Acts chapter 20, verse 10. Uh, uh, it talks about a soul returning to someone who has died. Oh, that's Eutychius. Chapter 20, verse 10. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said... Do not trouble yourselves, for life is in him. After someone had passed away. So we see that, man, even uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 8, we are absent from the body and present with the Lord, when it talks about when we die before Christ returns, so that we have a body and we have a soul. But Jesus also has a soul as well. John 19, 30 talks about how he gave up his spirit. Luke 23, 46, Jesus himself, Father, into your hands I commit my 
Spirit. And as we've seen at Free Grace Baptist Church with respect to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, says his soul is exceedingly sorrowful. See, Jesus possesses both body and soul. He is like us in every way, yet without sin. But even tied to the fact that he has a soul is the fact that he has a human will as well. We see he has a divine will and a human will, both wills in agreement. That's a great mystery, isn't it? One person, two natures, but he has two wills according to both nature, but both wills work in agreement with one another, in harmony with one another. And we see that in the garden as well. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Both wills working in agreement. Because if he did not have a human will, how could he be truly human? That's the very question we're going to ask with any sort of the, the, the false doctrines that come up. How could he be truly human? How could he be the perfect mediator between God and man if he did not possess all our attributes and is like us in every way? Could he truly make human decisions if he had only a divine will? He must be fully God, fully man, but we confess there's one person, two natures, but there's two wills, but working in harmony. So we see these are properties, he's body, soul, and tied with that, with the soul, the fact that he has a human will. But not only that, he experiences common uh, 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 things that we face, common infirmities that we deal with, things like hunger, thirst, weariness. Matthew chapter 4, when he's being tempted, he expresses hunger. Matthew 4, verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. I'd be hungry after 40 days and 40 nights as well. John 19, 38. When he's on the cross, I thirst. He needs the things that nourish his body. He needs the things that you and I need in order to sustain our bodies. But he also grows weary as well. John 4, 6. You have had a long day at work. Praise God, we have a Savior who's like us in every way. 4 verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. Mark chapter 4, when he's dealing with that storm, the storm that comes upon them. Uh, uh, the, the wind and the waves, when the wind and the waves obey Christ. It says in verse 38 of Mark 4, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Now you think about the preceding context. He had been teaching morning till night about the kingdom of heaven. He's so tired that he's sleeping through this massive storm when these, these experienced fishermen are terrified. Jesus sleeps. He also expresses human affections as well. Compassion. Mark 1, 41, when the leper comes to him, Jesus was moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him and said, I am willing to be cleansed. He's sad. If you and I go, if you've ever gone through sadness or sorrow, Jesus Christ went through sadness and sorrow as well. Jesus wept for Lazarus in, G in, in John chapter 11. There's many other things he went through as well, but he is the perfect mediator, the perfect savior for us. And he's like us in every way, except for something that's very important, without sin. That's what the writer to the Hebrews confesses in Hebrews 4. He's the great high priest, the one who acts on our behalf. He's like us in every way, yet without sin. You and I sin each and every day. And because of our sin, we deserve eternal punishment. We have this king who came, lived, died, and rose again. And he was without sin the entire time. And so we see here then, we see this compassionate savior, this one who identifies with us. I love the words of one uh, writer, J.C. Ryle. He says, he knows the trials of a man, for he has experienced them. He is just the very Savior that men and women, with weary frames and aching heads, in a weary world, require. 
for their comfort every morning and night. We have one who is like us in every way, the one who identifies with us, the one who is fully human, that we can go to, that we can call upon, that we can pray to, who is both fully God and fully man. And he's compassionate and loving and good and with us, his people. So we've seen then how he became human. We've seen some places in scripture and some things that show that he is truly human. Let's look at another, uh, a great mystery as we bring this kind of person, uh, the, the, the study of his person to a close. Namely, how he is one person. If you don't get anything from this study, if you can just get one thing, one person, two natures. If you can confess that, you're doing very well. And if you remember that, that's fantastic. One person, two natures. But this is a great mystery that no, no analogy can describe. So I can't use any sort of things of common man to explain what it is, because it's a great mystery. So there's the unity of the person. There is, according to 1 Corinthians 8, 6 and Ephesians 4, 5, there is one Lord Jesus Christ. There is one Lord, according to Ephesians 4. And the thing is that's inseparably, inseparably joined uh, uh, one person, two natures, very God and very man. Yet there's no conversion in them. There is no, there's no confusion with the natures. There's no change in the natures. There's no division of the natures, separating one, two persons and two natures. There's no uh, 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 separation of those natures. There's no mixture. You see, there were some who argued that there was a mixture, as the divine almost absorbed the human. But as I've asked already, if the divine absorbed the human, how can he be truly human? And how can it be a human who saves man, or saves us from our sins? But not only that, there are others who argue that there were two persons and two natures. But if there are two persons, who is it that died on the cross for us? Which person? And if we talk about two persons, are we then dividing one person of the Trinity, if you will? We cannot say that. It's one person and two natures. And so then how do we define person and nature as we think about these things? What is a person? A person is a difficult thing to define. It went through a lot of changes. But a, a, a pithy way of thinking about it is one moral governor. One moral agent. Perhaps the complete definition would be a complete substance endowed with reason and consequently a responsible subject of its own actions. Complete substance endowed with reason and consequently responsible subject of its own actions. If there are two persons, who is responsible for the actions? But this is the great mystery, is that there's one person who operates according to both natures. Yet both natures never conflate and they're never separated. How do we define, in essence then, the essential qualities of, what, of a thing, the properties of the thing? What makes us what we are? That's why we say Christ took on a human nature, not a divine person. You see, we see the person of the Son even at work before the Incarnation. According to John 1, he is the agent of creation before he's incarnate. We see him at work in the Old Testament. Matthew 23, verse 37. It's with the, uh, when he's giving these woes to the Pharisees. Then he gives this lament in verse 37. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. When did he do that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 speaks of Christ as the rock. Uh, it's talking about the rock and uh, verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. 
For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ Jesus, was Christ himself. So he's at work. And even when we, excuse me, think about Philippians and Galatians, to be born of a woman, to be taking on human flesh, that presupposes that he existed prior to that. How could he be sent if he did not exist prior to that? So one person, one moral agent, is at work. And we confess, brothers and sisters, that he's a mediator according to both natures. This is where the mystery comes to a great mystery even further as we talk further about what this is. We must speak of what we called, I think I talked a little bit about it last time, the communication of properties. You see, one person, two natures. What you say about the nature, you can say about the person. But what you say about one nature, you cannot say about the other. That is, I can say Christ slept according to his human nature. The person of Christ slept according to his human nature. I can say the person of Christ is eternal according to his human nature. Or, sorry, divine nature. According to his divine nature. But I cannot say that Christ is everywhere present according to his human nature. That is, that's where the divine then influences the human nature. Do you see that? One person, two natures. You, what you can say about the nature, you can say about the person, but not one nature towards the other. So there's unity, and so because of this mystery of the unity of the person, sometimes we do see in Scripture places where one nat- uh, 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 where we see perhaps human attributes given to divine titles, or the opposite. That's because of the mystery, that's because of the unity of the person. One person. So what, the one thing that is proper to one nature is sometimes attributed to the person denominated by the other, though improperly. We see this when we think of human attributes with divine titles. Luke 1.43, the mother of my Lord. We can say that because he is a pers- the person. Acts 20, 28. Saved by God who shed his blood. If God is invisible, how can he shed his blood? Well, we can say that because of the one person and two natures. 1 Corinthians 2, 8. They crucified the Lord of glory. Similar thing. How can the Lord of glory be crucified if he's invisible? That's the blessedness of the mystery of the one person in two natures. We see divine attributes with human titles. John 3.13, the Son of Man who came down from heaven. Or John 6.62, the Son of Man who ascended to where he was before. See, one person in two natures. So when we see things that are attributed to the divine nature in Scripture, it's not as though though there's a conflation in the natures, but because what we say about the nature, we can say about the person. I think John Calvin is very helpful and shows the necessity of this, of this mystery. In short, since neither as God alone could he feel death, nor as man alone could he overcome it, he coupled human nature with divine that to atone for sin he might submit the weakness of the one to death, and that wrestling with death by the power of the other nature he might win victory for us. We need him to be one person in two natures. We need him to be fully God and fully man. As that one who acts on behalf of God who is fully God. As the one who acts on behalf of man who is fully man. So, we must confess, brothers and sisters, this is a great mystery. And it's one that should cause us to adore our Savior. Oh, come, let us adore him. As one writer says, It is necessary to pause for a moment to consider this mediator whose name is wonderful from every perspective in order that we might properly be motivated in godliness. First, this wondrous work shall neither be comprehended nor fathomed by angels or men to all eternity, but will always remain an unfathomable source of adoration. One person, two natures. As I said last time, it took our forefathers five years 
to actually formulate this truth where it makes sense, where it's proper, where it's precise, even though we are still speaking in the manner of men. Again, if you take away one thing, one person, two natures. And when we think of this great mystery, we can confess with the psalmist, who is man that thou art mindful of him? So then in conclusion, we do see that Christ is truly man. We see that Christ is truly God. And it signifies that God dwells with his people in Christ. And that because of Christ, because Christ has been raised in his human nature, those who are human in Christ may have a raised nature, a, a, a raised body as well. Will receive that resurrection as well. Because Christ overcame death according to, uh, as the work of both, uh, as the mediator. And as that mediator, man may have everlasting life through the resurrection of Christ, through the man who was resurrected, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And we even see a compassionate Savior in that he is like us in every way. He experienced the things that we experience, yet without sin. And lastly, we must adore the person of Jesus Christ. As we, in a similar way, as we confess with John Flavel, God, God contrived all our happiness before we were, but he did it with excellent design and execution of what man requires to commune with God. Fully God, fully man, one person in two natures. This is Christ our King. This is Christ our Lord. Oh, come, let us adore him. Well, let us pray. Oh, Lord God Almighty, who is man that you are mindful of him? In our sin, in our weakness, we know that we deserve everlasting punishment. We know that we deserve everlasting damnation, for you are a holy God. You are a perfect God. And when we broke your law, we, you either required perfect and perpetual obedience to your law, or eternal punishment. But we thank you for Christ our King. We thank you that you did not leave us in our sin. But you sent forth your Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who are under the law. We thank you that he is fully God and fully man. We thank you that he is one person in two natures. We thank you for this mystery, O God. We thank you that you've revealed yourself to us in your word. We thank you that you've revealed yourself to us in Christ, that we might know more and more of you and know more and more of Christ our King. We pray that you'd help us by your spirit to think of these things, to meditate on these things, to ponder these things. May these things cause us to worship you, to adore Christ, who adored the God-man, Jesus Christ. For those that are outside of Christ today, O oh God, we pray that they would believe on this God-man, that they would look to this one as the only perfect mediator between God and man. For those that know Christ, we pray that you would help us to be more in awe of Christ. We pray that you would strengthen us, help us to grow more and more, help us to, uh, to, to grow unto godliness, to resemble Christ our King. We know that we fail often, O oh God, and we pray that you would forgive us of our sins, and that you would lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. We know that Christ, when Christ is near, those temptations do lose their power, O oh God. So may we call on Christ, may we look to him, help us to remember that we are united to him. We are united, you united to us in death, and we are raised with him in the resurrection. May this give us comfort, may this give us hope, and may you be glorified, O oh God, in all things. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.